Welcome to the Biohackers live show. My name is Teemu Marina, and uh, yeah, we're going to continue today with Max Lukover, who is one of our actually opening keynotes at Biker's Summit on 1st and 2nd of November. Max Lukover is an American television personality, health and science journalist, author, and musician also. He resides in Los Angeles, California, and New York City. And uh, yeah, he's really uh, someone to look after if you are interested in optimizing your brain and cognitive capability as well as longevity uh, with the help of food. So he's someone who is a proponent of using whole foods and nutrient-dense foods, uh, uh, perhaps over supplements. Uh, so a well-rounded diet is definitely something that is going to be the foundation of a well-functioning brain. So uh, with that, uh, welcome to the show, Max. Thanks for having me, Tamu. This is, uh, I'm super honored to be here with you. Wonderful. So we met in Stockholm. You were a previous speaker at Biker Summit previously. And I remember that uh, you were really stoked about all the wild plants that we were, we were foraging there together. <laughs> uh, remember that moment? I, I do remember that moment. You single-handedly have converted me into being a lifelong fan of foraging. Um, which is something that now I look forward to having, you know, the opportunity to do whenever it arises. And I'm looking forward to doing it with you again at the up upcoming Biohacker Summit. Yeah, this time of the year, it's going to be definitely mushroom season and we might be able to find still some roots. So that's where a lot of the, uh, you could say, the, the life force really grows uh, or goes uh, and also grows at this time of the year. And that's where most of the active compounds are located is on the on the root system. It's kind of the plant upside down. On the summertime, it's it's uh, on the flowers, it's on the tops, on the new uh, growth shoots. And in the winter time, it it kind of uh, diverge. It it kind of goes back to the root system. And yeah, that's the time to do all kinds of cool tinctures and so on for uh, for supporting your uh, your. I guess your body and so many different levels. Uh, is there some specific plant that is your favorite when it comes to the kind of wild plant kingdom? Oh man, what a good question. Um, you know, I don't, I, I can't say that I have a favorite necessarily, but I do value the, um, the vigor that consuming wild plants uh, imparts onto you, onto your own body. And I think that we discussed this a little bit when you were on my podcast, The Genius Life, uh, just a few months back. Um, but yeah, I think that that's one of the reasons why uh, people generally should try to opt for organic produce whenever they can, um, and why those wild plants are so valuable to health in ways that we have yet to even scientifically describe. But you know, a wild plant has to fend for itself. It's out there in the wilderness, literally um, having to fend off from rodents, pests, fungi, and, and, the, and, you know, infections and the like. And so it develops all kinds of bitter, good for you compounds. And I think the irony is that um, the modern food supply has been, has been, is, is being essentially bleached of these compounds because you know bitter is not a, a flavor that human the human palate tends to favor yeah so yeah and bitter uh, tends to be also kind of where bad. bitter tends to be where most of the more complex compounds are most of the medicinal compounds are which are not on the food label so when you look at the shop you see minerals you, you see macronutrient distribution you maybe see a few uh, trace minerals in their vitamins and so on, but but many of the more complex chemistry is not really on the label, and uh, we I think we are shopping labels and not really looking at the complexity of what a, what a true plant can really be. So is this something that has come across in your research when it comes to you know looking at for example organic produce or wild produce compared to com completely lab grown uh, stuff that uh, people are uh, accustomed to consuming. Yeah, I mean, I would say insofar as polyphenols um, and other phytochemicals have come up in the literature in terms of their, their broad sweeping protection over our cardiovascular system and our brain and certain compounds like anthocyanins, which are found in blueberries and bilberries, um, an even more concentrated uh, source, which you brought up actually on, on my podcast, um, 
has actually been specifically mentioned in the literature as being particularly, uh, you know, having having particularly strong neuroprotective um, potential. Um, they've done a number of animal studies where they found that these uh, blueberry extracts have boosted cognitive function in um, smaller organisms. They've done observational studies um, in humans where they found that the consumption of berries, which contain um, certain berries contain these compounds, that their consumption is related to reduced cognitive aging um, by about two and a half years. So yeah, they definitely come up in the literature. And in terms of polyphenols, I mean, polyphenols are really the compounds in these, um, it's sort of a, a category umbrella term for, the, for many of the compounds that these plants developed, that they develop in the wild. And they seem to be beneficial in a number of ways in our body, either by stimulating our own sort of broad reaching antioxidant defense compounds like glutathione, um, or via the metabolites that our microbiota churn out uh, when they um, metabolize these polyphenols. So yeah, they seem to be very beneficial. And I think some of the more exotic plants that we're gonna be foraging for in Helsinki have yet to be studied specifically, but that doesn't preclude them, um, you know, in my view, from being an important part of uh, an overall brain healthy diet and lifestyle. Yeah. The fact that they haven't yet been studied, for example. I'm taking just right now an extract of a, uh, basically a bark of a tree. So there's, wow. there's like, this is a concentrated down like uh, extract of, of a whole tree bark. And just, you know, these compounds that I'm, I'm just going to get from uh, this particular tree is, is very useful at this time of the year for fending off any of those uh, potential viral infections that I might be getting by, by being exposed to uh, all, all these kind of uh, infectious diseases going around in terms of a flu. Yeah, so here we go. I'm microdosing wow. a tree. That <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I have a tincture that looks like that, um, or a few actually. One is a Shisandra berry, which is um, thought to possess adaptogenic properties. Um, I think I have cordyceps, and then somewhere I have uh, maybe a lion's mane tincture. So I, I like those tinctures. Right. It's a good, good delivery vehicle. Yeah. So so this uh, extract from 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 a pine bark is is basically what. Uh, provides these uh, proantocyan needs, which are uh, very, very, very helpful for the immune system. Now, mm, you are an expert who uh, often shows up on uh, several television programs on the US side, like Dr. Oz. So you are kind of an expert on, on some of these, um, you know, different produce and, and foods and their health benefits and so on. So if you would pick like some of the top foods that are extremely beneficial for brain health, which are the ones that you find yourself explaining over and over again uh, most often? Um, I mean, it sounds, I always feel silly bringing up avocados because I feel like in many ways, especially when I speak to audiences on the coasts of the United States, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but avocados are uh, what I would consider kind of an all-in-one genius food. It's a term that I've, I've coined to, uh, you know, describe foods that I think are strongly neuroprotective, but avocados are in many ways perfect. They have um, ample potassium, which is important to nourishing the um, the health of your cardiovascular system, which I think many people underappreciate in terms of its effect on the brain. I mean, your brain, the, the health of your cardiovascular system is crucial when it comes to brain health and optimal brain function. And so potassium is important for regulating healthy blood, blood pressure um, and nerve function. Um, but I think it, m more importantly, the compounds that, I'm, that I've been really kind of jazzed about have been uh, plant-based carotenoids or pigments like lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, avocados are probably not the top source of lutein and zeaxanthin in the produce section of the supermarket, but what makes them a particularly potent source of those two carotenoids is that 
those carotenoids are fat soluble. Their absorption and utilization by the body is negligible unless they're consumed with a fat source. And so avocados provide both of those compounds with an ample amount of heart healthy monounsaturated fat, which then allows for those compounds to be um, absorbed. And they've done studies where, you know, it, these are not great studies necessarily because avocados have a number of things, a, num a number of positive traits going for them. But they found when supplementing um, people, giving avocado, giving people supplemental avocados, uh, that the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin that they then are able to see in the macula, which is thought to correlate with brain levels of lutein and zeaxanthin, um, skyrockets. So the great thing about these pigments in terms of brain function is that not only do they help uh, boost neural um, efficiency, the efficiency of your neurons to create energy, They've actually shown in randomized controlled trials that um, when given as a supplement to young, healthy college students at the University of Georgia, that they were able to achieve a 20% boost in their visual processing speed. And this is significant because young people are thought to already be sort of at the peak of their cognitive prowess. Um, so it kind of caught researchers off guard that they could take this group of people that are already thought to be processing at their peak capacity and actually see an improvement in their cognitive function with these plant carotenoids. So I'm a huge fan of all foods that uh, contain them. Um, generally, you know, I feel like the consumption of them could be sort of a surrogate marker for healthy foods in general. They're found in egg yolks. They're found in the fat of grass-fed beef, kale, um, collards are all rich in, uh, in lutein and zeaxanthin. But avocados... Uh, contain them and a fat source so that they become, uh, you know, digestible to you. They're also rich in fiber, um, vitamin E, which is important to protecting your cell membranes against oxidative stress. So, yeah, I would say that that's uh, definitely a, a key food in the arsenal. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, avocado, uh, the, the skin parts and the leaves uh, also contain something called persin, which is... Hmm. Uh, uh, something that has shown in lab studies to kill breast cancer cells. And, uh, wow. well, I wouldn't recommend anyone eating the, um, the skins or, or any of that. Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of toxic to humans, but there is, there's a lot of potential in avocados in terms of studying the different compounds also for, for example, for cancer research. So, uh, what, what else have you noticed in, in the plant kingdom to be beneficial for, protecting us from potentially getting cancer? Cancer, that's a tricky one. I mean, to be honest, my wheelhouse is very much, uh, I've dedicated myself to becoming sort of a walking meta-analysis for um, what it takes to preserve healthy brain function throughout the lifespan. Um, mm. So Alzheimer's probably would be a better question. Like, how, Well, different, di different forms of dementia. You know, it's not just Alzheimer's disease, but also how the brain works in the here and now. Um, you know, there's this field called nutritional psychiatry, which is definitely, you know, within my purview because it relates to how the brain works and we want the brain to work better. The brain is really the battery that makes everything in life possible for us. So, hmm. um, but that, that being said, I mean, cancer is obviously, uh, you know, when it comes to procuring a healthy, uh, a long health span and lifespan, Nobody wants cancer. I mean, so I can offer my my thoughts on that, but I'm not definitely not an expert in cancer. Sure. So, uh, uh, I mean, if, if we just jump from that to uh, brain health and a cognitive decline, I guess like because people are living longer lifespans nowadays, they're more likely to get these degenerative diseases like different things that influence, for example, the brain. Uh, you, you also yeah. touched the cardiovascular cardiovascular system, uh, so yeah. uh, and I guess a lot of uh, problems in terms of brain health is also energy crisis, like uh, problems in mitochondria, and so on. And, and there's all these uh, studies that also look at uh, things like Alzheimer's, a kind of uh, like a type three diabetes, a kind of insulin resistance in the brain, um, so some yeah. kind of energy crisis. Like, can you? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on 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 those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, and one of the one of the underlying you know pathogenic features of 
um, Alzheimer's disease is DNA damage, which is certainly related to, to cancer. But when it comes to energy metabolism, one of the first features that seems to emerge in a brain that um, may go on to develop Alzheimer's disease is a reduced ability to generate ATP, which is the energetic currency of cells from glucose in the brain. Uh, the scientific term is glucose hypometabolism, which is evident in, in um, brains certainly that have Alzheimer's disease by there's an, a, a, about a 50% reduction in the brain's ability to create energy from glucose. So uh, that is a pretty severe state of affairs for the brain, which is the most metabolically hungry organ in the body. But we can see slight energy deficits almost across the age spectrum in people who are genetically at risk to developing Alzheimer's disease. So keeping your mitochondria healthy um, is, you know, is crucial. And there are very few things that we can uh, do to specifically test, as far as I know, um, how your mitochondria are doing. But we do know that there are um, dietary and lifestyle factors that are correlated to um, worse energy metabolism in the brain. And, you know, it all comes back to metabolism at the end of the day. And so many people today are, you know, overweight and or struggling with uh, conditions related to metabolism, i.e. metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And research shows that if you have any insulin resistance in your body, which insulin resistance is the hallmark of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, um, that there's a direct linear correlation between uh, the degree of insulin resistance in the body and the brain's ability to produce energy from glucose. So basically what you want to do as a sort of lifestyle precautionary measure to avoid that hypometabolism feature of that that we discussed earlier in the brain is look at what it takes to create a type two diabetic body and then run in the exact opposite direction. Mm. Um, so the dietary and lifestyle recommendations that I make are, um, you know, they're, they're kind of related to fitness, uh, generally in the sense that the best way to avoid becoming a type two diabetic is to be fit is to, you know, is to chase fitness. And so I'm a big advocate of, um, you know, a number of different lifestyle factors, everything from optimizing your sleep, which can have an, a, a significant impact on uh, your metabolic health to resistance training and making that a priority in your exercise routine. Right. Um, and, then, and then certainly eating a diet that is healthful and avoids polyunsaturated grain and seed oils and simple sugars and refined carbs. Um, those are all important parts of the, of the metabolic health equation. Right. There is a, on the chat, there's a question from Don IT on omega-3 to 6 ratio, that is it really kind of important for brain health to to get that uh, kind of in balance? I guess there is a kind of um, this idea of getting your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio to 1 to 2. So for every single molecule of omega-3 oils, you have 2 for omega-6. And in Western diet, it seems like uh, uh, this ratio has been tipping more in the direction of omega-6. Yeah, way more in the direction of omega-6. In my book, Genius Foods, I cite research showing that um, a skewed ratio can actually affect the way that your brain works uh, in terms of executive function. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the fact that we're consuming fewer omega-3s than ever before in human history and more omega-6s, um, the thinking is that that, uh, that skewed ratio basically stokes our body's um, inflammatory pathways. Um, and I think that getting a lot, getting a, a healthy amount of omega threes, whether it's through your diet or through supplementation, um, does benefit the brain in a number of ways. It helps, you know, offer the brain building blocks that it requires to grow healthy new brain cells, which we now know that the brain can do up until death. Um, but actually I just tweeted, uh, you know, the largest ever meta analysis of, of omega three supplementation was just published. Um, and it found that, uh, omega threes when, when taken as a supplement in the form of fish oil can significantly reduce cardiovascular events, including heart attack. Um, and there seems to be a dose response in, you know, that emerged over, you know, in this, in this meta analysis, um, that the more omega threes a person takes, the greater the reduction 
uh, and risk in terms of cardiovascular events. And this is, you know, they didn't look specifically at uh, cognitive, you know, at neurodegenerative conditions. Um, but again, you know, the the health of your cardiovascular system is crucial when it comes to optimal brain health. So I think that the omega-3 brain health story is important. People who eat more fish, um, which provide, which is one of the primary um, providers of omega-3s in the diet, um, have a, a risk reduction for developing Alzheimer's disease, especially if you carry the uh, most well-defined Alzheimer's disease genetic risk factor, the APOE4 allele. Um, so I think that it's, uh, yeah, minding that, um, mm. minding that ratio is very important. And in, as a, as a side effect, what you're inevitably going to have to do is avoid grain and seed oils once you begin to correct that ratio, which is healthy, you know, which is good for the brain in a, in a totally different way, because those, those oils, aside from providing, um, an abundance of omega-6 fats also provide a number of, uh, toxic chemicals like heterocyclic amines and things like that. Right. So what else do you kind of recommend as your top list of things to do for brain health uh, besides uh, eating more pa more plant polyphenols, more omega-3 oils, maybe avoiding uh, kind of especially rancid vegetable oils and um, yeah, like getting some sleep and resistance training into your protocol. Like what else would you throw in? Um, sleep is important. I think, you know, being mindful of the light that enters your, enters your eyes. You know, I'm reminded of that by you wearing your blue light blocking glasses yeah, um, evening. every like day. Having a cup of coffee from my, from my uh, wooden cup. So I'm kind of uh, compromising my real health benefits here. But yeah, I'm someone who is a fast metabolizer. So I get pretty good sleep, even though I get, you know, a cup of coffee this late in the evening. Although it kind of will skew a little bit my uh, circadian rhythm. And there is a lot of uh, talk about this at the Biker Summit. We have several experts on uh, circadian biology coming over to the Biohacker Summit. Maybe we can jump over to to the website very quickly, and and then we just get Seam Land also on the call. So let's take a look. So we have Dr. Greg Potter coming over. He's an expert definitely on circadian biology and how you can optimize your sleep, especially deep sleep. And uh, we also have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Smar, who is a professor of bioengineering and data science, uh, PhD wow. in neurobiology and behavior. He's a top expert in terms of, uh, very, very data-driven in terms of how, how you can uh, really hack your circadian biology for better uh, recovery, sleep, and, and health. Uh, so, so yeah, there is there is some top experts coming over uh, on these things, and yeah, Seam Land is uh, is is one of our kind of uh, resident uh, <laughs> uh, guests in in the Bikers uh, live show, and I would love to bring Seam on board because he's he's someone who's been looking at autophagy, and uh, uh, so maybe if uh, the guy behind the decks can. Uh, Throw seam, <laughs> seam online. Awesome. So just mute yourself. Seam. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you we can. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, <laughs> great to see you guys and uh, looking forward to the summit. Yeah. So uh, li listening to Max uh, sharing some of his advice, um, what would you add in terms of like uh, some key things? I mean, you've, you've been looking definitely on exercise and circadian biology and uh, fasting, for example, for for general health and well-being. Yeah, like Max Max gave a really good overview about all these uh, main principles and especially the diet. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the polyphenols and uh, omega threes as well. So <laughs> uh, definitely keeping them in my diet uh, on a consistent basis. But I would maybe add, like, yeah, I, I'm I'm sure like Max does fasting as well in some aspects. But in my experience, like just some form of intermittent fasting is one of my best <laughs> brain hacks and one of my best uh, nootropics just for uh, the sheer focus as well as uh, the general uh, health. Because uh, not only like does fasting promote ketosis and ketones, but it also promotes the autophagy in the brain, which can actually help to uh, protect against Alzheimer's and uh, clear out some of the uh, you know beta amyloids that accumulates there. So. Yeah, I think that fasting is uh, some of the best ways for me and many other people to just uh, be more mentally clear 
during the daytime, as well as just protect against the, all these diseases. Yeah. Can we really quickly show my screen actually here? Uh, so, thank you. So here's from Seam Land's Twitter, uh, the recent post on um, eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, spiking your insulin uh, within a 12-hour eating window versus having like uh, one meal per day. So is this something that you see in practice yourself uh, to activate autophagy every day? Uh, well, yeah, like I personally eat uh, one meal a day within maybe like a few hours. But I would say that if you compare it to something like two meals, then that's already, uh, it's almost like as equal. And there's not like much difference in terms of autophagy. But yeah, like the main idea is that if you are doing the standard three square meals a day, then you're not really gaining a lot of the benefits you get from uh, time received eating and autophagy. So those those benefits only happen if you are in this very suppressed state of insulin and low mTOR, and uh, you can't really avoid raising insulin and raising mTOR even if you eat like a very low calorie diet. So mm. that's why like the magic happens if you're actually in this very confined state of. Uh, restricting your all calories within a certain time frame that you get like these unique metabolic benefits. Right. What, what do you have Max to say about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of intermittent fasting. I think it's, um, yeah, I wish we had a way of measuring autophagy. I mean, I, I definitely am, uh, you know, I feel like we have it sort of going on at a low level, probably at all times in different parts of the body. Um, and then it becomes up leveled with you know, just a few hours of fasting. I also think that um, one of the key benefits of that 12 to 14 to 16 hour fasting window is that we deplete our liver of glycogen. Um, and so it sort of provides a buffer for any starches and carbohydrates that you might consume. It, as um, Sim mentioned, it, it encourages the production of ketones, um, you know, clears out some of those stored fuels. And, uh, and yeah, and then on the other hand, I think it's also a means of sort of honoring the body's natural evening circadian inclinations to not eat at night. Um, you know, I've spent a good amount of time at this point with Sachin Panda, who is one of the you know leading researchers in the field of circadian biology um, over at the Salk Institute. I went down to the lab and interviewed him for my podcast, but since then we've uh, spoken at a number of conferences together, and so I've, I've you know spent a good amount of time with him and I feel like uh, one of the one of the key benefits that you get is better digestion um, from not eating super late at night you know the organs of digestion kind of want to go to sleep um, that's my interpretation of it anyway you know I mean you'll obviously always be able to digest food no matter what time of day it is but um, the kitchen sort of closes so to speak to use a, a restaurant metaphor um, peristalsis slows later on in the evening and um, I think that that's, you know, eating food late at night and allowing food to sort of, you know, linger in the small intestine can actually help pr promote uh, bacterial overgrowth there because yeah. food is, you know, yeah. more able to be fermented um, at a time when it should more rapidly pass through and peristalsis is sort of faster. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's all these, I feel like there's all these benefits that are, that are independent of, uh, you know, weight management i think a lot of people especially that i come across on instagram in the fitness community um write off intermittent fasting as being solely a means of of calorie control but um but yeah i don't i think that it's uh i think it's a it's more more complex than that certainly. right i was speaking recently to yeah one of the professors in finland who is uh, is a top expert on mitochondrial health and she mentioned that uh um, the relationship between amyloid beta and um, impaired mitochondrial function that we don't yet actually know exactly in science if mitochondrial function uh, first goes down and that results in, uh, in accumulation of amyloid uh, uh, plague or if amyloid plague is, is contributing to the uh, reduction of uh, mitochondrial function but these things are definitely interlinked. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Now, um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about cleaning the brain from amyloid plague, but it seems like amyloid plague is also kind of a protective mechanism of the body uh, in this impaired state where um, those those kind of proteins tend to start lingering around. Um, 
what can you say about this, Max? Uh, because you know better, as well as also maybe how people could clean out some of uh, or reduce if you, if you're not if you're sleep deprived and you increase your or you're drinking some alcohol maybe for years and you've been impairing your deep sleep to kind of clean out that amyloid plague, maybe eating a crappy diet, maybe you have poor mitochondrial function. Like, what would you do to kind of help the brain recover itself? Yeah, well, three things. So first, um, you know, as, as I mentioned that glucose hypometabolism in the brain, which is sort of a mitochondrial defect has been shown to emerge, um, on scans well before the expected appearance of those amyloid plaques. So, um, my understanding of the literature is that the metabolic dysfunction in the brain occurs well, uh, or mitochondrial dysfunction occurs well before the presentation of those plaques. Um, secondly, uh, when it comes to amyloid being a protective compound, I would agree with you there. I think that, you know, it's no, um, secret that other animals produce, uh, amyloid that it's conserved throughout many species. Um, and they've found it to be increased, um, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, the presence of the viral load in the brain, they've identified herpes virus over at Harvard. Rudy Tanzi is doing some of this research. Um, it coincides with inflammation and yeah, that reduced, uh, ability to create energy in the brain, which are all sort of pro inflammatory, um, you know, pathological events. And so, yeah, I think that, I think that the story on amyloid is that it's very similar to cholesterol in that, you know, for a long time, due to our limited scientific tools, cholesterol was thought to be sort of the chief causative player in heart disease. And now we know it's more of sort of like the, you know, it's there at the scene of the crime, but maybe it's an innocent bystander. Is cholesterol the true cause of heart disease? I don't think that um, at least the more progressive within the medical community are really seeing it as that um, anymore. You know, there are, what, are, what are the underlying variables that are going to cause this accumulation of cholesterol in the arteries and the hardening of the arteries? So amyloid, I think, is kind of a similar thing. You know, amyloid was one of the first things that was identified in the brain, and that sort of coincided with uh, the, the 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 description of Alzheimer's disease on those early autopsies. You would open up an Alzheimer's disease riddled brain, and you'd find these plaques and tangles. Um, but I think the the it's you know the pharmaceutical um, uh, you know inquiry into finding effective treatments for the disease that have focused on this amyloid hypothesis to remove amyloid from the brain um, have just been a miserable failure. And so I think it's causing the field now to look at uh, what precedes that and what causes that amyloid to be building up in the brain as this protective measure. What is it protecting the brain against? I think that's like the key question. For some people, it may be, maybe there's bacteria in the brain, maybe it's viral uh, maybe it's inflammation. Maybe it's this, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction. I think it's probably different for every person. Yeah, or it um, might be a kind of combinatory thing that the viral load goes up in a situation where the brain is already out of homeostasis and impaired, so the virus gets the opportunity to take over. So, so there's kind of all these, all these things that we uh, see. Uh, even the kind of uh, the way how tau proteins are sticking to each other in Alzheimer's disease, instead of uh, doing what they normally to do to stabilize the microtubules. Uh, so, uh, I mean, kind of what, what would be the kind of practical ways how someone could be able to protect their brain? I just read an article that um, the compounds in, uh, in cannabis might be beneficial for reducing uh, the amount of uh, amyloid plague in the brain, uh, similar to what deep sleep might be doing. Uh, yeah. Have you not come across yeah, any uh, other other kind of uh, plants that might help be helpful? Um, yeah, well, certainly sleep. There's some animal research that suggests that extrovert the polyphenols and extra virgin olive oil might um, encourage autophagy in the brain, that cleaning up of the amyloid plaque. Um, and certainly people who consume diets that um, incorporate extra virgin olive oil seem to have better brain health and, and to be protected against uh, Alzheimer's disease. As you mentioned, sleep is important. We know that sleep is one of the primary means in which the brain cleans itself of these proteins that can aggregate and form plaques. Um, I'm not aware of the research on uh, CBD that you mentioned, but I will definitely look into that. That, that was on, the, on um, THC, actually. So CBD. THC. Oh. Yeah. CBD is, uh, is not contributing 
to that side uh, as long as wow. as far as I remember. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, there, we're probably going to be figuring out more about these things. And there's a question on the chat about the connection between the gut microbiome and brain health. So is there anything else, anything that you kind of come across right there when it comes to brain health? Absolutely. I mean, the gut microbiome in many ways has an ability to modulate uh, immune function in the body and inflammation is a, you know, is one aspect of immune function. And insofar as its ability to, you know, increase or decrease levels of inflammation in the body, I think we've got to be very mindful of gut health these days. Um, one neurodegenerative condition in particular, Parkinson's disease, has been closely linked with what goes on in the gut. And, you know, the story is just beginning uh, as far as, as our understanding of that connection goes. But it seems that there's an ability of gut microbiota to influence the um, ability of another protein in the brain, alpha-synuclein, to uh, cross-link and clump and form plaques that are um, more descriptive of or more, uh, uh, you know, which would better describe conditions like Parkinson's disease or another form of dementia called Lewy body dementia. So, um, so I think that story is just being written, but I think it, it, regardless, we do know that the gut is important and, um, and that, you know, consuming a diet rich in polyphenols, a variety of um, fruits and vegetables, um, you know, I think diversity is, is pretty important in terms of the diet. Uh, and cutting out the sugars and, um, mm. you know, I would advise cutting out uh, or, or at least being cautious of, you know, artificial sweeteners um, and, uh, and antibiotics and things like that. Right. I know that seam is uh, eating carbohydrates separate from fats. Uh, so there, there are some recent studies on the fact that uh, fructose, uh, which is... Uh, abundant in fruits might be uh, co- one of the causative reasons to non-fatty liver disease. Uh, so it's kind of accumulates, it, it kind of impairs your fat metabolism. So seems, seem, what can you kind of uh, um, uh, explain to people about this connection of, uh, of carbohydrates and brain health? I think there is a long-standing belief that the brain runs on glucose and somehow like ketogenic diets and all that is going to impair your brain function. Uh, I guess that's kind of uh, about to be shown to be not like so. Well, uh, yeah, it, well, it is true that your brain does need a certain amount of uh, glucose every day, but it doesn't have to come from uh, dietary carbohydrates. You can very easily produce that glucose from your own endogenous sources, whether that be from the gluconeogenesis of uh, protein or fatty acids even, you can just convert your body fat into glucose and use that. Uh, While at the same time, if you are in ketosis and keto adapted, then uh, the majority of the brain's energy demands can already be covered with the ketones ketones themselves. So uh, in any case, you don't really need a bunch of uh, like carbohydrates to fuel your brain you just need to be somewhat keto adapted. Uh, while at the same time, like, you know, carbs themselves aren't bad. Uh, I think like just most of the studies that correlate uh, both carbs or fat with things like diabetes or uh, other diseases, it comes from just combining them uh, together, which creates this very uh, afflictive situation in the body where it's uh, not able to use those fuel sources quite efficiently and, you know, creates like this uh, mild insulin resistance and, uh, oxidative stress and so on so uh if if you if you have like a bunch of uh carbs together with fat then you're also uh, in some aspects you're uh, preventing your body from producing insulin and thus keeping your blood sugar elevated for longer and uh, slowing down the response so uh, that's that's most of the if if you were to just dissect those uh, micronutrients in separate groups and eat them separately then uh, you would uh, avoid most of these uh, like uh, damage that occurs mm. Right. So, uh, Max, what do you think like uh, about this? And is, is there anything that we haven't yet touched upon that you find very important when it comes to brain health and understanding the nuts and bolts of, of taking care of, of that part of your body that we cherish as the, as the seat of the soul, as well as kind of the, the conductor as, uh, and, and also the source of all the creative power and, and human capability that makes you know us control this meat machinery around and do cool stuff (laughs) 
Yeah. Well, on the, on the carbs and fat combination thing, I would agree that, yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that the re the research is as clear in terms of, you know, meal timing, although I'm, I'm open to the idea because I do think that consuming carbs and, and fat together, um, probably, you know, overloads the liver in some capacity and floods the blood with, uh, you know, fats and carbs, which cause insulin to raise thereby shuttling all the fat into your fat tissue. Um, and certainly the, you know, high carb, high fat, uh, milieu is, is descriptive of the standard American obesogenic diet. So, um, when you look at some of the most successful populations around the world, they tend to eat either high fat, low carb, or, um, you know, low, uh, fat, high carb. And so you don't really find this middle ground where you're just eating lots of fat and lots of carbs anywhere, but in the standard American diet where 66% of people are either overweight or obese. So, um, I would agree that there's probably something to that. I, um, I, I'm really, uh, worried about, you know, the world where it might be going with, uh, people, not just, you know, being overweight and metabolically impaired, but their brain function also goes into decline and on a collective level. I mean, what kind of impact does that have on decision making, on managing, you know, anger and hatred and I'm kind of, you know, stemming from there. Like if you don't have a well-functioning brain and you're not happy, you have brain fog and you're not performing very well, you do mistakes, you know, you, you put yourself and maybe people around you in danger also because of the impaired brain function and, you know, just being not a nice person to be around with. Like, I mean, what, what is that doing to the collective psyche? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's probably, you know, our diets and lifestyles and the fact that we're all metabolically uh, dysregulated and overweight, I think that's probably having a massive impact on our collective consciousness and ultimately behavior. And there's, I mean, you look around, um, we live in an inflamed society, which, uh, to, to paraphrase one of my, um, mentors, Judu Krishnamurti, you know, the world is a reflection of the inner world. The outer world is a reflection of the inner world. So to be living in such an inflamed society, uh, it makes perfect sense that the individual would be inflamed as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that there's certainly something to that. You could also revise that, that the brain is a reflection of the inner world. Like <laughs> what you put in your body, you become, uh, uh, maybe one thing that we could touch. I know that you need to go soon, but Adam pipe is asking about kids and what would you advise maybe parents to protect the growing brain? Like what should they be looking after? The growing brain. Well, I mean, I would say the recommendations are not all that different from what I recommend to adults, because we know that the brain continues to grow and maintain that quality of plasticity up until death. But uh, for, you know, a, a kid or a child whose brain is undergoing rapid organization um, and development, I would say, you know, getting ample DHA fats um, from oily fish, uh, maybe, you know, salmon eggs and things like that. Um, phospholipid DHA, I think is probably pretty important. Um, but DHA in general, uh, I would say choline, getting adequate amounts of choline, which literally form the, you know, help form the, the membranes of your neuronal cells. So eggs, I think are important for a developing brain. Pastured eggs are a genius food as well because they provide both DHA and, um, and those phospholipids. So yeah, eggs, fatty fish, um, grass-fed beef. Um, they've done some studies in, I believe it was either Nigeria or Kenya, where they found that um, you know meat-enriched diets, uh, children tended to perform better um, on uh, you know in their academic in their in their schooling as well as displaying greater signs, better signs of mental health in the on the playground. Um, mm. So red meat, grass-fed grass beef, um, eggs, fatty fish. And uh, yeah, I think those are most important as sort of like the building blocks. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, organic produce, crucial. Um, you know, I think as a, as a kid, you're much more insulated. So I would be, I would, and, you're, and you're, your brain is going through that development. So I would prioritize the foods that I mentioned earlier 
And then on top of that, I would put in all the, you know, sort of antioxidant protect protection uh, conferred by organic produce. That's wonderful. Low sugar fruits, things like that. Yeah. Now there's a bunch of questions coming in, but uh, I guess like people have to come to Biker Summit to ask you in person. You're going to be there both days and throughout the conference. So there's plenty of opportunities to interact with me and Seamland and, and Max Lugover and a bunch of other people. And uh, so um, I thank you very much, uh, Max, for coming over. And uh, what is your kind of message to anyone who's still kind of uh, wondering if they should come or not to help Helsinki? Oh, man, Temu. Well, thanks for having me. And I definitely recommend um, coming. I, to be totally honest, that was, a, it was going the first time to Stockholm, Sweden for the biohacker event uh, was life changing. I mean, it was amazing. I got to meet you guys and the whole team, but the upgraded dinner was uh, one of the best dinners ever. And I love knowing that some of the ingredients being used were foraged that day. Um, and then I loved the process of foraging, learning about that, learning from you guys. And then, of course, I'm just a huge fan of saunas and cold immersion and all that stuff, which I know that we're going to be doing um, as well. So I'm excited. It's Europe's uh, and and increasingly the world's top biohacker event. So That's be right. there or be, be square. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You won't have a well-functioning brain unless you visit Biker Summit once in your lifetime. So thank you very much, guys. And uh, looking forward to, to meeting you in Helsinki soon. And uh, with that, I mean, have a extremely healthy brain for the rest of the day. Thank you, Timo. Wonderful. With that, uh, just like... Uh, Anyone who's still watching over there, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of questions coming over. So we're going to be posting an edited version of this. Uh, tomorrow we have also Mad Ventures coming along. There's still a bunch of guests that uh, I want to get interviewed before the Barker Summit. And uh, one of them is uh, Dr. Benjamin Smar, who we just mentioned on uh, circadian biology, the professor of bioengineering and data science. He's definitely one. And uh, yeah. Uh, there is also, um, yeah, I'm, the, the kind of presentations that I'm personally really looking forward to uh, is from Dr. Lou Lim, uh, the, the person behind Vialite. Uh, I had a personal chat with him on the health benefits of photobiomodulation and low-level laser therapy. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 what they are working on Behind the curtains is extremely interesting. And we also have Wade Lightheart coming over, certified sport nutritionist and three-time all-natural bodybuilding champion. He, he's all for fixing the gut and uh, looking at the microbiome, probiotics and, and e enzymes and, uh, and so on. So, so he's going to be there opening up uh, on the second day together with uh, Dr. Molly Malouf uh, on blood sugar management. So it's going to be all, all, all amazing. So um, with, uh, you know, follow us at biker summit and uh, also if you have any questions and so on just post with the hashtag biker summit we'll be following on and, and uh, yeah tomorrow we have the mad ventures episode it's going to be fun the, both of the guys are going to be here in the studio so to you over there you know enjoy also rest of your week amazing see you later